My name is Neil Curry. I'm the facility director at the Witt Stevens Jr. Central Arkansas Nature Center uh, in Little Rock. We're located in the River Market District and I'd like to give you a, a tour of, the, uh, of our facility. Uh, the, the center was established uh, back in 2008. Uh, we're the fourth of uh, four regional nature centers. Uh, the first was established down in Pine Bluff. The second one was in Jonesboro, Arkansas. The third was in Fort Smith, Arkansas. And last but not least, uh, this is the fourth location uh, right on the Arkansas River Banks between the amphitheater and the I-30 bridge in downtown Little Rock. Uh, so let me, I'm going to take you around the center and show you some of the exhibitry and uh, you'll very shortly hear what, what we do here because we're going to have a group of children come in and they're going to probably go throughout the exhibit area too. So uh, you'll see the center live and in action today. One of the first things folks encounter when they come into the center are big photography displays. We've tried to incorporate art and photography throughout the building. Uh, most of the photography is from Arkansas artists, uh, photographers, and uh, the art is from local artists. Uh, but one of the main things is trying to let folks know that th this nature center is sort of a portal to learning more about the outdoors of Arkansas. And when you talk about Arkansas, there are six natural divisions of Arkansas that are, are very uh, easy to point out to folks. The Ozark Plateau, the Arkansas River Valley, the Ouachita Mountains, the Coastal Plain, Crowley's Ridge, and the Mississippi Delta. Uh, we're so centrally located in the state, within the several hours, you can see every one of those six natural divisions. And there aren't very many states in the United States that can say that they have a, a diversity of wildlife like elk, and alligators. And so Arkansas has a diverse population of wildlife. A lot of folks know more about Australian wildlife or African wildlife than they know about Arkansas wildlife. And if you come to the Nature Center, this is where you can begin to learn about your native uh, state. And whether it be the wildlife, the uh, plant life, uh, or the activities you can do in Arkansas. If you always wanted to, to fish, don't know how, this is a good starting point. We can, we can give you some direction on that. If you're looking for hunting opportunities, we can do that. If you're looking for a good place to go bird watching, um, you can see about 20 species of birds at any, any day here at the center. Uh, along the Arkansas River Trail, which is right next to the center, uh, we've seen over 100 species of birds since we've opened. So uh, you don't have to go far afield to see a diversity of wildlife here in central Arkansas. Since we are a nature center, a lot of folks associate us uh, look, having live animal displays, and we have a, a combination of both uh, live animal displays and taxidermy mounts. Every animal you'll see in the center is native to the state, even in our gift shop. If you go into our, our gift shop, all of our resale items complement our, our natural state theme. You'll find stuffed black bears, but you won't st find stuffed polar bears in the gift shop. But we have uh, reptiles and amphibians, on display, turtles uh, and snakes and lizards uh, are most of our live animals displays. We have an outside bird feeding area. Uh, I mentioned the variety that you can see here. Uh, we've also had groundhogs, a gray fox, rabbits, squirrels, uh, uh, possums, raccoons, a lot of different wildlife uh, visit along the river. The a great wildlife uh, sort of a corridor for them. Um, but the, one of the main emphasis that we do here is to educate young people, and that's what you hear coming through the door right now. Uh, we, we do scheduled programming, and also folks, if, if they have a group that just want to walk in, uh, it's, it's a public facility, free of charge, it, it's paid for by the conservation sales tax. So every Arkansan who uh, pays one-eighth of one percent to help uh, support facilities like this for the Game and Fish Commission. That, that same sales tax goes to, to help support the Arkansas Parks and Tourism Commission, the Natural uh, Heritage Commission, the Keep Arkansas Beautiful Commission, and the Game and Fish Commission. So it's a great way that not very many states have that conservation sales tax, and we wouldn't be able to provide uh, uh, programming for this number of children if we didn't have that support of all Arkansans. How are you? And these folks are doing one of the activities you can do just about any time if you have a, a family group come in or a, a, a group. It's called a nature center bingo. 
and they're trying to locate a variety of different animals that are found throughout the building. So they might be looking for a white pelican or they might be looking for a pileated woodpecker or an alligator snapping turtle. You never know what might be on the bingo board that they're trying to locate. And if they look up, sometimes it helps find, to find the white pelican. This year we are, our Arkansas Game and Fish Commission is celebrating its 100th anniversary. Uh, so we've had a birthday party events here at the center celebrating the, the, the 100th anniversary. Well, we have several publications that have been uh, published now. We have a new movie that we uh, incorporate into our theater that also talks about the history of the commission. But this, we do a lot of temporary displays and this display just shows a variety of you know, the, what the cost of a license was and back in 1930. Uh, things have changed a little bit, but you still had a hunting license back then. Uh, so we, we try to update our exhibits so we have some exhibits that are here year round. We also have some special exhibits that we'll, we rotate out throughout the year. So uh, earlier this year we had a, a fantastic wildlife photography uh, display. And now we have a, you'll see a, a, an exhibit on a snowy owl that was seen in Arkansas, I think back in uh, 2013. And unfortunately, it got hit by a car out on the interstate, and now we have developed an, an exhibit around that, that bird. But as you can see, live animals are very popular here at the center. Uh, we do have alligator feedings on Fridays at, at two o'clock. We also have uh, fish feedings on uh, Wednesdays. So there's a variety of things that are scheduled. Our website has those posted and I always recommend folks go to our website or like us on Facebook to get more information. When you, we enter the main exhibit hall, uh, there are a combination of different exhibits. There are several large glass cases that is a, it's basically a, a historical timeline of conservation in Arkansas from pre-European uh, settlement to the present day. So you can get an idea if you're new to Arkansas or just moved to the state or want to know a little bit more about Arkansas conservation history, this is a good place to start because it'll, it'll walk you through uh, the years in, in, in time. On the back side of these cases are exhibits that feature our, our enforcement division, our uh, wildlife management division, and our fisheries division. A lot of folks uh, just think about our wildlife officers and that might be the only, any, only interface they have with game and fish but we do have an education division uh, we have support divisions uh, that help that this agency run so it gives them uh, folks a little bit better idea of what the agency is all about uh, one of our most popular exhibits is our, our over 4,000 gallon aquarium displays we try to have a species of fish that are found in these different natural divisions so you might see a rainbow trout in the Ozark tank, and you might see a, an alligator gar in the Arkansas River tank. So uh, we do change out fish species over time, so we can't have every fish species in Arkansas, but we've got a good representation of the fish that you might encounter uh, on, on a fishing trip in Arkansas. Most of our centers throughout the state have some sort of aquarium component to them. Um, the other centers that we, we talked about have over 100 acres associated with them. Uh, we're in downtown Little Rock, so we couldn't find 100 acres, but we have three and a half, and uh, we, we have made the most of what we have uh, as far as exhibitry. Outside the building, we have landscaped uh, native wildflower beds and plantings uh, that are plants that are beneficial to wildlife, and we have a, volunteer group called the Arkansas Master Gardeners, Pulaski County Master Gardeners. And they are fantastic volunteers for us. We also work very closely with the Central Arkansas Master Naturalist Program. These individuals devote uh, thousands of hours to the center in, in educational programming and time and labor, blood, sweat and tears. So uh, we are always looking for new volunteers, so come join us. take a look at our, our theater also. Uh, we do tr try to incorporate, not everything's gonna be labeled or identified, 
because that's the part of discovery about nature. We want folks to you know, question, you know, do I know what that bird is? Uh, and then we have resource materials here where you can, you can find out. But so we're, we're not gonna have everything labeled. Uh, we want to make sure that folks have a sense of discovery uh, when, when they come into the center. And this is our entrance to our main theater area. We have a 12 minute uh, presentation that talks about what our wildlife biologists and fisheries biologists do in the field. A lot of times people don't get to see that biological research work. So if you wanna see you know, somebody working in a bear den, that's what our movie shows. If you wanna see how they raise channel catfish from fry to the catchable size they release in some of the community fishing ponds, that's shown in our film. We're working on a new film that will basically invite folks to explore the central Arkansas area uh, because we realize that you may not get to immediately go to a game and fish uh, facility except the nature center. So there are lots of other resources and some other nature game and fish centers or properties in central Arkansas that a lot of folks still have, have to discover. So that's what our new film is going to talk about. But our entrance to the theater is a replica old bait shop. And uh, instead of just having a door, doorway, our, we realize that a lot of folks uh, have fond memories of going down the bait shop and getting a couple dozen minnows and, or buying some worms. I'm old school, I used to dig worms. And you can still dig, dig them for free in Arkansas. And since fishing is such a popular activity for a lot of Arkansans, Another very popular uh, exhibit that we have on display is a, one of the largest antique fishing lure displays. And it's located in another part of the center that we'll, we'll, we'll show you here in a little bit. Uh, but this, we have one of our volunteers, this is a, just part of his collection. And uh, Little Rock sometimes, uh, if you've watched Antique Road Show, well we have an antique lure show here where if folks have an old tackle box they've found in their aunt's uh, closet somewhere or they, they found something at a flea market that I think is real valuable fishing tackle. Uh, about once a year we have that r uh, roadshow appraisal of, of basically folks uh, in a, a lure collecting club helping the public identify what they what they have in their collection and once you see this collection over here uh, you'll, your jaw will drop. We get a lot of uh, multi-generational uh, groups. Uh, we will have a grandmother talking to their granddaughter or you know, a father talking to their son saying, you know, that was, that was a fishing lure that I caught my first fish on here. You might see a Razorback lure. Uh, whether it, I think uh, we always tell folks a lot of these lures might catch fish, but they've definitely caught a fisherman because somebody bought them. And we really also want folks to realize that one person can make a difference in conservation. And the exhibit next to this features uh, sort of the background information on a gentleman named Raleigh Rimmel. And Raleigh was a very active member in the Ducks Unlimited uh, organization. And he was an Arkansan that passed away uh, several years ago, but his family wanted his, his story told. And, uh, they said, well, you know, the National DU headquarters in Memphis uh, might like to talk, uh, have this display, but they wanted it here in Arkansas. So uh, uh, a lot of this material is just a small sample of what one person can do for uh, wildlife conservation. And, and Mr. Rimmel was a strong advocate of waterfowl conservation, uh, not just in Arkansas, but across North America and Canada. One of the things that he was known for was called a Raleigh stick, and he had uh, individually carved walking sticks that he presented to uh, individuals that were Arkansas ambassadors, whether it be uh, former President Clinton, or uh, I think he, 
Uh, you may see several uh, governors represented in this, in this display also. And we talked about the uh, entrance to our theater, but you can also get a look uh, in this location of our exit in our theater. And we've recreated a, an old uh, hunter trapper cabin, uh, something that you might have seen in the backwoods of Arkansas in the 30s or 40s and, or in the 50s, and there are probably still of them out, some out there today. Uh, but uh, the history of trapping is one of the things that has, uh, uh, is definitely part of Arkansas's history. And we've tried to portray uh, that it was not an easy uh, endeavor to, to be a trapper. And uh, a lot of kids have never just seen a, a, a wood stove. Uh, so the trapper's cabin, the floor might creak a little bit in there. And uh, we've got a lot of uh, items in there that uh, tell a little bit more about the uh, trapping history. And also uh, uh, there are a lot of fur, animal furs in there that they want to feel a skunk without catching a skunk. Uh, the trapper's cabin is a good place to check out. You know, we try to show that you know, there you know, are ways to, to enjoy the outdoors and you can sometimes have a little base camp, something like this. Uh, might not be the fanciest accommodations, but there's a folding cot and a wool blanket that you can get down out of the rafters. Uh, you don't have to worry about uh, rodent control when you have a big black rat snake skin that well, is evidence that there might have been a, a snake catching some of the mice and rats that might be hanging out in the cabin. Uh, there might be a bird nest or two stuck in the rafters in here. Uh, a lot of uh, early uh, carbide lan lanterns that were used during, uh, when they went raccoon hunting or frog gigging at night. Uh, instead of having a battery powered lantern, they were actually using a gas that's emitted from a carbide. The same type of lanterns that ma miners used to wear when they would go down into the mines. Uh, so it takes, takes folks back a little bit in time that you know, it was not that many years ago, things were a lot different. Uh, not quite your, your, your mobile home, your, your hunting uh, RV that you might have at, down at deer camp now. Uh, we also have been very fortunate that a lot of individuals find artifacts that they think might uh, help with the interpretation of the, the history of Arkansas. And we've had several individuals bring in older magazine publications that, that have price guides and things like that about, you know, if you wanted to sell your furs to St. Louis, uh, this was from the, er, I think, mid 40s, something like that. And during the Great Depression, uh, a possum skin being sold might have made the difference of, you know, a family having another pair of shoes. So uh, the, the fur industry uh, is definitely something that uh, they're still very active trappers today, and it's a very important part of uh, reducing predator populations. Uh, we always enjoy seeing how many different ways they, uh, the children have arranged the plates in here. Uh, there, we've seen lots of uh, dinners being served in the trapper's cabin. The, the coffee pot usually has a cup right next to it where they've, they've warmed up the coffee on the, on the stove. We, and we want that sense of uh, imagination and, and discovery to, to be an active part here at the center. We also teach uh, various uh, workshops here. We have a classroom that's on the other side of uh, the center, but we uh, have scheduled hunter education classes here. We have boating education classes, uh, we have teacher workshops, uh, first skills workshops like you know, basic catfishing, things like that are offered here. Uh, but there are some things that we want to make sure that the outdoors is as safe as possible for everybody. And that's why mandatory hunter education and boating education is, is now part of uh, the, the educational efforts of the Game Fish Commission. Uh, we do online testing where you may, if you can't make an instructor-led class here, there are different options you can do um, by doing it on the internet now. A 
lots of, uh, I mentioned several of our other conservation groups that help us with the, the, the gardening projects and the master naturalists, the National Wild Turkey Federation often will have their board meetings here. Uh, they have helped in, in some of the exhibitry here because a, a lot of folks uh, don't realize uh, that the enjoyment that getting out in the early spring can have uh, to explore the outdoors and turkey hunting is, is one of those extreme challenge uh, sports that immerses you in the outdoors and it's, this is just a sample of some of the, the types of things that uh, the Wild Turkey Federation does and, and how they support uh, s s the agency and conservation efforts here in Arkansas. You'll see everything from turkey calls uh, that, that are hand carved by Arkansas call makers to uh, the beards and feathers of, of the, the big gobbler turkey, turkeys in here. That's the challenge of Arkansas is whether to be out in the woods uh, turkey hunting in the morning and then you can go spring crappie fishing in the afternoon and take a nap during the middle of the day if you want to. I mentioned earlier about the, the uh, so some of the other uh, agency divisions. This uh, case showcases our fisheries division and also some of the more unique uh, fish that we have in Arkansas. There's one in there that's an American eel and that uh, species of fish actually starts off, uh, can spend part of its life in the ocean and the other part uh, in freshwater inland. And we do have freshwater eels here in Arkansas. Uh, the, there's also one called the paddlefish or spoonbill, and that's another fish that is becoming rare in uh, many parts of its range, uh, but we do have them in the Arkansas River drainage and the Mississippi River drainage, so uh, that's a fish that sometimes the folks that are snagging below the locks and dams of the Arkansas River uh, encounter, and they can get over 100 pounds. Uh, they look like a shark, but they're actually a plankton eater, and they filter out a uh, small uh, animal uh, out of the water and then uh, we we also are known for some of our big lake reservoirs having large striped bass and, and largemouth bass both uh, here in Arkansas and we wouldn't have the diversity of fish if we didn't have uh, clean water and we have several displays on mussels and it's not this kind of mussels it's this kind of mussels and the freshwater mussels uh, we have some of, uh, one of the largest number of mussels found in the United States, a variety of different kinds. Several of them are very rare. Uh, there are some that are endangered in Arkansas. Uh, we have, uh, at one time, we had a, a huge industry in Northeast Arkansas called the button making industry. And we have several examples of mussel shells that are actually punched out by machine and, and so before they had plastic buttons they're using um, freshwater mussel shells to make polished buttons out of. And so uh, lots and lots of shells were harvested out of the streams. But the thing about mussels is they're an indicator of water quality. If you don't have a, a good healthy mussel population, that might give you an indication that there might be uh, something that uh, may need to be looked at as far as water quality. Because if you're a little animal that sits in the bottom of, it, of a river, filtering water in and filtering uh, water out, and there might be some toxins or something like that that can build up in your body and that causes you to go away. And so uh, that can make it a difference. But mussels are a very interesting uh, exhibit that we have here. A lot of folks don't realize there's that much variety in those strange, strange creatures. 
and our enforcement division are a very important part of our, our agency. We have at least uh, two wildlife officers per county. Uh, they do a, a variety of different tasks and duties. They enforce our wildlife and fisheries laws and regulations. They help in disaster relief. Uh, they do have a canine team. Uh, they help in. Uh, we have a, a very well-trained uh, dive team, and uh, they are also excellent educators in, in promoting our agency. So, uh, if you see a wildlife officer, uh, get to know them because uh, they often are a wealth of information about uh, the wildlife resources of uh, of their county. This is Jake. This was a popular exhibit uh, during our 4th of July weekend. Uh, we, we highlight the uh, birds of prey, our, our national symbol, the American bald eagle on, on the right. And we have another eagle species in Arkansas that most folks uh, don't uh, get an opportunity to see as often, and that's a golden eagle. And uh, there are two different birds, uh, live in two different types of habitats. Uh, the material that you see below our, our eagle nest here was actually uh, found in and under a bald eagle nest that was blown out of a tree by a storm a number of year, years ago just off the Arkansas River in Perry County and that the bald eagles have been catching turtles and feeding and pulling the turtle out with their beaks and their talons and feeding it to their young and so uh, you think of bald eagles eating fish but you, you, you may not get an opportunity to see that there are other things in a bald eagle's diet besides fish and all those turtle shells sort of prove that point. And the golden eagle uh, is, is found in open grassland areas, uh, some of our national wildlife refuges and some of our larger wildlife management areas that we maintain. Uh, occasionally we'll have ball, uh, golden eagles on them, but they eat uh, more rodents. Uh, they also eat snakes, uh, rabbits, things like that, where the, the bald eagle's uh, more of an aquatic uh, eagle. You're gonna find them normally around rivers, streams, and lakes in Arkansas. And in the wintertime, we get a large migration uh, bald eagles migrating from the uh, northern states down to Arkansas. So if you want to see bald eagles, the winter time from October to February, best time to see a large number of bald eagles here, here in, uh, in the state. And uh, it's getting close to the two o'clock alligator time. So uh, if you haven't been down to the center, I invite you to come, come check it out. There's a lot more outside to, to explore. Come early in the morning or later in the evening if you want to walk around and see the wild wildflower gardens outside. Middle of the day, is come on in and enjoy the air conditioning. Hey guys, um, my name is Maurice Jackson, like Ms. Uh, Gray just mentioned. Um, I'm actually a fisheries biologist by trade. Um, one of the most popular activities that we do here at the Nature Center, at all our nature centers, are the animal feedings. Uh, fish feedings, uh, alligator feedings, even eagle feedings. We go as far as uh, having eagles at some of our nature centers. I encourage you guys to go to AGFC.com and click on the edu education tab and look for all the different nature centers around the state and uh, you'll find something new at all of them. Um, of course, alligators guys are pretty unique. How many of you guys are afraid of alligators? <coughs> okay, how many, raise your hand up again. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Y'all come over on this side. What I'm gonna do is take these alligators out and just let them run around y'all. Y'all gonna be cool, cool with that? Are you on a 
<laughs> now guys, alligators have been around for millions of years. And the reason why they've been around for so many years is because if you have more than one trick up your sleeve for survival, you'll be around for millions of years. One little key aspect of the alligator's uh, trick of being around for so long is this little deal right here. Anyone know, anyone, somebody said mushrooms? Close, looks like a mushroom. It's the roof. The roof of his mouth? This is actually, we call these scales. It covers the alligator's whole entire top part of his body. And so, just like a lizard. So when they get up to a certain size, say four to six feet in, in, um, in length, the only animal that can take them out here in Arkansas are people. And we do have a hunting season here in, in uh, Arkansas. The permits are issued around June and they usually do the hunts around September or in the fall. But this is a, a feature that allows the alligator to be around for so long. Because again, when, they, when they're harvesting the animal, you gotta, you gotta t hit them in a certain spot, which is a soft spot behind the head in order to, to take them out. Because bullets will actually bounce off this. Yeah. Um, another feature about the alligator that has allowed him to be around for millions of years is, that thing real? is the fact that he can go a long time without eating. Is this real? You want to hold and see? <laughs> no, it's not real. But we actually do sell these at our gift store, so make sure you go by there and visit before you leave. The other feature that allows the alligator to be around for so, so long is the fact that he can go a long time without eating. It stores a lot of his fat in his tail. How long do you think he can go without eating? Two, 72 hours. A year? A week? We only feed these guys once a week. We feed them once a week. Somebody want to know why? Because they're cold-blooded. We're all a warm-blooded, so we have to eat multiple times throughout the day, so we have to maintain that core body temperature of 90-something plus degrees. Um, these guys are the same temperature as the environment, pretty much. So when it's cool like it is inside the building, in this aquarium, we can get by feeding them once a week. How many of y'all like to turn y'all kids into, into cold, cold blooded animals? <laughs> Feed them once a week. One meal a week. And check this out, check this out. We have a larger alligator about six foot in length in Pine Bluff. Labor Day is the last time he'll eat until Memorial Day, the following year. That cold blooded thing, having cold blooded kids starting to sound real good right by now, right? <laughs> but, but check this out. Again, this guy been around for millions of years. He can actually go three years without eating. Wow. Yeah. Does he grow? Not the small guys, the, the adults. Ma'am? No, they don't grow much when they're not um, eating. Um, here in Arkansas, considering how cool it is, we have colder winters. These guys grow about six, uh, six uh, inches a year. Um, farther south, like Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, places like that, they grow up to a foot a year. Well, why do they show, <coughs> this is TV, why do they show an alligator like if you fall in the water, they ain't got to eat for three years or a year, why are they running after people, you know, when they fall in the water? Since we've been keeping records, only two people have ever been injured by alligators. And one was um, actually out in the woods somewhere actually hunting and he stepped on a four foot alligator. And, that, and these guys are probably about a little bit tall, a little bit longer than these guys here. But it didn't, you know, he didn't get injured or anything. I think he did get injured, but um, that's the only incident of that. And the next incident was when a couple of guys saw an alligator and decided to pick it up. And guess what? Somebody got bit. So when you see these guys out in the wild, you want to stay away from them. More than likely, if you see an alligator, he, he saw you way before you seen him. And so, good eyesight, he, 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 he stays away from. No one in Arkansas has been killed by an alligator. These guys tend to stay away from people. They are more so afraid of you than anything. You know. Um, speaking about the bite, alligators, they lose thousands of teeth throughout their lifetime. Thousands. Any, any dentists in the house? Okay. 
they lose thousands of teeth. Their teeth aren't made for chewing. When, when we feed these guys, you'll see when they're eating that food, they're going to swallow it whole. They're not going to chew it like how you would chew your, your teeth. These are basically canine teeth. Look at them. They're, they're hollow on the inside. See, they're not made out of much. Now, the bite of an alligator, as the young man just mentioned, the bite of the alligator is so strong, when he, whenever he's out eating or hunting prey, he tries to kill it instantly. So he's designed, say for example, uh, the weight of this animal when he bites down on something is 3,700 pounds per square inch. 3,700. It is the strongest bite of any animal here in Arkansas, I think even here in the country. Well, of course you got the crocodiles. Crocodiles, I think the next one's a little bit higher, a little bit stronger. But when he bites down, just imagine 3,700 pounds of pressure. Just multiply that five, six, seven times. Boom. So it's pretty tough. Are there any questions about the alligators before we start feeding them? You got it. Now, alligators are opportunistic animals. What do you like to eat? Okay, he likes macaroni. Guess what? I have something here that's shaped like a macaroni that these guys love. Guess what it is? Mice? No, these are large uh, night crawlers. Big worms. Just like fish. And what? I, before I feed them, guys, let me let me uh, tell you something else that real that's real unique about alligators. During the springtime, alligators, that's when they have, make babies. And what happens is, if you're a male, some people wonder, some people want to know how do you tell whether it's a male or female, it's very difficult. They don't reach maturity as far as having babies till they're about, I think, 10 years old or six feet in length. But, um, when they do make their nests, the female, of course, she'll dig a hole and she'll lay her eggs there. All the eggs are female. All the eggs are female. But what she does is she put plants and vegetation in there with those eggs. And when those, those plant, that plant material start to break down, guess what? It heats up. So once it gets up to a certain temperature, that's when the boy eggs start forming. So she mixes it up pretty good so that um, that happens. Yeah. So somebody asks, well, what if you got a bad mama and she just wants girls? <laughs> Instinctively in their mind, they don't, they don't operate like that. They have all a good mixture of uh, both sexes. So and warmer eggs become boys, is that what you're saying? Yes. By late fall is when the eggs start to hatch. Well, early fall, they start to hatch. Uh, they hang, the, the, the babies hang around the mom for about a year. So she'll, they'll swim in her mouth, hang out in her mouth. She'll teach them how to hunt and stuff like that. They'll ride on her back because... Um, during that first year, a lot of them get lost to other fish eat, eating them, other animals, even other alligators. Now, when the, when, when the mom and the dad mate, the, ba the, the father is chased off the nest. He's gone because mama don't want him around because he tried to eat up, eat up all the eggs. So some bad, you know, that's kind of, yep. All right, we're going to go in and feed these guys. All right, like my man said, he likes macaroni. You want to try? Anybody want to try? Yeah. You want to try? No, no, no. I'm talking about eat it. Oh. <laughs> Again, guys, he's not chewing. What he's doing is positioning that food so he can swallow it whole. Uh, we about three. Well, you know, three or four a piece. Yeah. Do they have taste buds? Yep, they do. That's a good question. Do they have taste buds? I would imagine they do have taste buds, but of course they're probably not like how our taste buds are. Um, they do have uh, a sense of smell and taste, but not as keen as what you would. 
Yeah, you would they think. Eat in front of them, yeah. They? yeah, they'll eat any. They're, they're, they're pretty much opportunistic animals, and what I mean by that, they will eat live, mainly meat type. Yep. Yeah. Will they fight each other? Most of the alligators um, tend to be, when they're not mating, they're all out to themselves. Um, they don't really um, hang around a lot with each, other, with, with each other unless there's a big food source nearby that can sustain all of them. But most of the time they're out alone. And they, they do a lot of their hunting at night. So that's when they're more um, active, moving around at night. Okay. Believe it or not, I didn't think the bigger guy was going to eat because, um, you know, I, well, we had them on TV this morning, and uh, normally they don't feed well when they come come back. Now, once they start getting to a certain size, like you, like as far as the company they keep, like these two alligators, if they get really, really large in size, they will actually take one of them or well, kill each other. The bigger one will. So we try to keep them all the same size. Because as an animal, you know, it, it, it's thinking, oh, I got competition, and if he's gone, I can eat more food, and... Well, they keep growing bigger and bigger in this container, or they sort of... They, they, they say, alligators grow all the way, continue to grow throughout their lifetime. They never stop growing. Uh -oh. All right, here's the main, here's the main course. Now, wait, 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 hold on just a second. Now, if these alligators could talk, they'd probably say the same thing about what you eat. <laughs> but these guys will eat anything made out of meat, living or dead. No, what he's doing is he's taking the smaller end and trying to get it positioned. Now he didn't turn the thing all the way around. He'll turn it around so it'll be easy for him to, sw <laughs> to swallow it whole. Uh -oh. You notice how he did that twist? Now, now what it does, yeah, death row, basically. That's how it tears off meat, off a deer or these large animals.
Doggone. 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 Yeah, they don't mess around, man. They go straight to the... So what kind of digestion do they have that allows them to bones, organs, meat, skin, hair? What is that? What? They just all, like, just digestive juices do the trick? What is that? Yeah, they just designed to handle that. Um, that? Oh. Now, these crickets are kind of special. What we've done is uh, we had a... A young lady that was that knew a whole lot about reptiles, and she introduced us to this powdery stuff, this calcium that we coat the um, crickets with, and they like eating those. So this is extra added calcium. I don't know if you guys noticed, we also have fish in the, in this aquarium, so they can have something to supplementally feed on when they get hungry throughout the week. I guess it's, yesterday was uh, day six of no food, so maybe the old fish are gone now. Are they active hunters? Are they going to like, stalk it and search it, or just when something comes by? Whatever comes, I mean, whatever comes by. How they're often can they they're known. They known for eating a lot of the animals that get sick. Uh -huh. Fish and mammals out there, you know, otters, anything. And, yeah. If they just eat a big meal, could they go ahead and eat again and just double up? No. On like they're full. They're done. No. For no, no. It takes them about two and a half hours. I mean, they'll just lay still if they're really full, and, and they won't. Eat anything. They won't that's when they're vulnerable too, sure. all the predators. Yes, sir. Will they swallow like bigger animals whole? Like, will they swallow bigger animals whole? Like, if it's like a baby deer or something. Or rip it. Yeah, they'll rip it in pieces, yeah. Or they'll will, if they can fit it, yeah. They'll swallow them whole. Yeah. 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 About three or four years old. But again, if they're out in the wild, they'll grow a lot la larger. Um, so, do these ever get released into the wild? That big one that's in there now, this large guy, he's actually too big. And um, we tried to trade him in at the alligator farm in Hot Springs. That's where we swap them out at for smaller ones. And they didn't have any small ones this year. So, And we also had to turn the heater off to slow down this growth. If we kept the heater on, he'd be a lot larger. <laughs> yeah. Do they actually like swim around and stuff? Do they swim? Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. In a bigger pool? They didn't hear all the time. No, they didn't hear all the time. Every now and then, we'll take them out for school groups and let the kids touch them. And yeah, that's pretty cool. That, those are crickets. Mm -hmm. We have some for sale in the gift shop. You won't try some. <laughs> Calcium crickets? Do they need exercise? Like, will they get, will they, do they need the right size tank or are they going to get No, I mean, that's, that animal is just, just designed, to make, designed to make it slow down. If it heats up, he'll speed up, move around. Are they fast swimmers? Oh, yeah. They fast on land, too. Thank you guys for coming. Here in Arkansas, we have four nature centers. One here, of course, in Little Rock. This is the last one that was built. We have one in Fort Smith, Jonesboro, and Pine Bluff. Our animal feedings are some of our most popular activities. Uh, for example, here in Little Rock, we do alligator feedings, and we also do fish feedings. Um, generally, we get crowds of them, upwards of over 100, 100 plus people. Um, of course, we also have school groups come out here that visit us as, as well, and we try to, try to plan those around the time that school groups are, are visiting us. Uh, here in Arkansas, we have about over 200, well over 200 species of fish. That's I mean different types of fish that live here. I always ask the question, you, which state has the most fish? Want to try? Alaska. Trick, trick question. Alaska? Yeah. 
not even close. Most of the diversity of species of fish and animals that live in water in the southeast. Um, actually, Tennessee has the greatest number of freshwater fish. Remember I mentioned earlier it was a trick question. Alabama actually has more different types of fish. You also have freshwater fish, brackish water fish, and you also have fish that come in from the Gulf that actually kind of hang out in fresh water sometimes too. Um, Arkansas, we're, we're probably in the top 15 as far as the number of, of uh, species of fish. Um, the most, to me, the most, we have various fish from, from the river that live here in the aquarium that we have. 9,000 gallon aquarium, this is the largest aquarium we have here uh, that Game of Fish owns. The, the largest aquarium we have is in Pine Bluff and it's about 30,000 plus gallons. It was the largest in the state until Bass Pro Shop built their 30 plus thousand <laughs> gallons of water. Um, some of these fish are common, uh, of course, in the river. You know, we're being located, situated on the river, so we get a chance to talk about some of the different species that, that are out there in the river. Largemouth bass, of course, is, is what? What do you think about largemouth bass when you think about fish? fish for <laughs> most popular fish in America is largemouth bass. Um, out of all the fish we have here in the aquarium, it's probably one of the most aggressive fish. It will eat anything live that fits in his mouth. Uh, just past week we had some extra mice that were left over and just drop one in there and he come up there and get them. So, you know, uh, very aggressive. Uh, again, most popular fish here in America. We also have what we call the leucistic gar. Uh, it's an alligator gar, which is all, all white. And that's, that's rare to see. Uh, we also have uh, one of my favorites. I like the catfish. The catfish have taste buds all over their entire body. And so I always joke with young people, I say, well, you can, can you just imagine you can taste your buddy's burger or fries with your elbow. Yeah, yeah. The whiskers that they have, they feel around on the bottom. They also, it's also an extension of their tongue so they can taste whatever they're getting ready to, to eat or consume. Um, fish, catfish are very unique. Um, a lot of animals that are described or, or that we find out in nature, you know, if you, if, you just, if you discover an animal, you get a chance to name it. Yeah. So catfish, of course, has whiskers, largemouth bass, because it's big mouth. Um, during my career as a fisheries biologist, I've seen at least 12 animals, mainly that live in water, fish or mussels or crawfish discovered. And so, you know, every year thousands, worldwide, tens of thousands of animals are discovered every year. So I tell kids, you know, science is one of those cool things that um, you never stop. You can't learn, I mean, it's just a lot to learn. Um, I guess we can go ahead and get started feeding the fish. Um, let's see. <laughs> Largemouth bass, every time we get ready to feed, um, he's the fastest out of all the fish that we have in this aquarium. Um, and this leucistic gar, extremely sociable. Anytime somebody comes up to the aquarium, she, you know, he just comes up and just hang out. The, the, the thing about fish, now this being alligator gar, it's one of the oldest fish that we have here uh, in the aquarium. Been around for millions of years since the dinosaur age. Um, the thing about animals that survive um, that, that, that length of time, uh, you have to have more than one trick up your sleeve as for survival. Uh, alligator gar are known to um, be able to breathe air, take in air, they have a specialized organ that allows them to take in fresh air. Whereas the rest of the fish in the aquarium uh, that we have, like your largemouth bass, your catfish, they have to actually take the oxygen out of the water uh, with their gills. And so they're kind of at a disadvantage if you're in a situation where you have low oxygen and that's the only way you can, can, you can breathe. Most of the fish kills or something like that that happen here in the state, a lot of them, you know, um, has something to do with low oxygen situations that, that, can, that can occur sometimes. All right, I guess we'll go ahead and feed these guys. Again, we feed these guys once a week. Any reason why you think we feed them once a week? Keep them hungry. Keep them hungry? Keep them alert. <laughs> now, out in the river right now, that river's probably running close to 90 degrees. Inside, this, this is room temperature. These guys are cold-blooded, so if you can control their body temperature, you can control how much you feed them. Their metabolism slows down. The colder, the water they need more food. The hotter water needs, needs more food. Um, colder it gets, the less we have to feed them. We actually have a chiller on one part of the aquarium where we actually put um, trout in, um, and that water has to be really, really cold. Uh, but we also have another aquarium too next to it that uh, has some of these river fish in there, so they tend to not grow as much because the water is, is really cold. 
Okay. Most of the fish that are here, of course, they eat other fish. Today is not a good day to be a small fish. <laughs> Generally, the gar species, they, unlike the bass, the bass can just take in all the fish at one time, multiple fish, and just engulf them, just swallow them whole. Um, the spotted gar and the long nose gar, they have to, they'll actually take their fish and go to the back to the aquarium and try to turn it around so they can eat it, so that the other fish won't take it from them. Now we have a fish over here that never comes out until it's feeding time. And I joke with people about, you know, you having a friend that come over and that's, that's the only time he comes over when it's dinner time. You don't see him, but he sees you. And he sees me. He's gonna come out right now. See him? If you notice the camouflage on them, <laughs> that's how Mother Nature cre created them. They blend in with their habitat, blend in with their surroundings. That tank, they usually eat all these within a couple of days. That's why I put some extra was in there, because they, you know, if you don't, they'll uh, start eating on each other, especially that big gar. And he's an ambush predator. What he does is he likes to sit back and just be still. And then all of a sudden, boom, he can bit off somebody's tail and that's what he usually go for, because if he can get that, that, tail, that caudal fin, that tail fin, you can't move after that. He can just pretty much have his, have his way. And there's been times we come in and the bass or something lost his tail, and that's because of the guard. But that's what guards do, they just, they're in their nature, they just um, ambush predators and it's just that nature comes out of them. Just like the flathead, he's actually the bully in the tank. Yeah. Um, you look closely at this drum here, some of these markings on them, it show up better on the, on the other side, I saw it earlier. But they'll have scales missing, that's because of, because of him. You'll see him when he swim, well he can turn back around. See the markings on them now? That looked like a bite mark on the back part of that tail. Or back when his back fin, his top fin here. So they are, are they more active at night? Like the lights are out and everyone's gone? Or are they more nocturnal? Yeah, there's, they're, you know, cat, of course catfish are more nocturnal. I mean, they, of course they're nocturnal. They come out at night. Majority of them do. Um, yeah, probably a little bit more activity going on at night when it comes to those guys. Again, like these minnows, they'll be in here for several days. And in some cases, this, this tank had them, on up, had them since last week. So with all the locks and dams on the river, do the fish have trouble like navigating? Like, is there certain like spawning things and stuff that are prevented by that? Or? Yeah, the gar itself, um, you know, the alligator gar, which is that leucistic gar, uh, the one of the fish you said you saw earlier, yeah. it, was, it was common to see them huge, 100, 200, 300 pound fish. Wow. But since we restricted their um, range by putting dams on the rivers, they don't get as big anymore. Huh. 
That fish used to go all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Huh. Yeah. So did they, I mean, the, the river's broken up into so many sections mm -hmm. with all the dams. Uh, you know, the diversity of the fish, do they have, they can probably get downstream, but they can't get back up, right? When they open up the floodgates, when there's high water and stuff, but they probably can't get back up the river ever. They're, I mean, they're, they're mo I mean, they're, they're restricted mm -hmm. for the most part. And um, that's one of the things we've noticed as scientists over the last, since we had, the, since the dam's been put in place since the early 40s to late 70s, that a lot of the fish, uh, especially of course the size and of course the species diversity has, has mm -hmm. gone down some. Yeah. Now out of all the catfish species, this guy here gets the large, that's the blue catfish. He can get up to, I think the largest one in Arkansas, like 100 plus pounds. 